presentations or they want to bring us in here and sit us in these seats and talk to them, making good choices and good decisions and I can do anything and don't do this and don't do that. And I remember when I was in high school, in my high school, in my middle school in Indiana, and I would sit in seats pretty similar to this and they would have these presentations happen. At the end of the day, if I was 100% real, raw, truthful and honest, I didn't care one bit what the speaker, the communicator was going to talk about too much. Normally these presentations happen in school, so I was just glad that it was a math class and English class, but I didn't like either one of those. And I was going to probably sit next to my friend or my guy and be disrespectful, because no way somebody from the outside is going to come in here and tell me about this and about that. How many of you in your school year, right, you have these assemblies, you have these presentations, right? And they bring in these school speakers. And if we were 100% real, real, truthful, and honest, I'm just real, man. Real knows real. I, I just, I lay it out there. How many of you have had these communicators before in your journey from middle school to high school? And you've had them, and at the end of the day, man, you really didn't care what they were saying. You were just glad when the assemblies happened, so you weren't in class. Anybody in here? Right? Cool. Listen, check this out. My name's Nate Harmon. I travel from coast to coast, speaking high schools, middle schools, colleges, all across this nation. I promise you this today, in this, in this space, in this moment of time, I'm not going to stand up here and stand behind some podium and, and, and not move and just bore you to death. And I'm not going to hold up a little fake bag of drugs and say, don't do this and don't do that. I just want to get real with y'all, man. From the front to the back to the left to the right, I promise you, if I had enough time to spend time with every single one of you, I mean this to hear your story, to hear your journey, to hear your message, to hear how you got to where you are and what you want to achieve with the difficulties and the adversities that we're facing. I will listen to every one of your stories because in this room, I need it with everything inside of me. Every single one of you were born to leave your fingerprints on history. Every single one of you were born to achieve and to accomplish and to succeed and to write and to paint a masterpiece called your life. And I promise you that you are in control of this thing called your life. And no one's gonna spoon feed it to you. And this conference, I know it's called I Can, and it's something that's so powerful because I believe in everything, man. I get passionate, not because it's just oh, what I do is my job, man. I truly mean every word of this, that every single one of you from the front to the back and left to the right. You can achieve anything. And so the last couple of days you're even saying this, and I want you to say it with me again. I want you to say, I can. Loud. I, I can. I must. I will. I need you to be loud. I can. I will. I must. I can. I can't hear you back there. I can. I will. I must. Now listen to me, y'all. I promise y'all, man. This talk, this lecture, it's different. Here's what I need y'all to do for me real quick. I need every single one of you to raise your hands right now. Hands up, hands up. If your neighbor's hands are up next to you, give them a rib shot. Okay, hands down, hands down, hands down. Watch, watch, watch. Hands back up, hands back up, hands back up. Make sure your neighbor's hands are up. If not, rib shot, hands down. Great, now check this out. I know now, this morning, that none of you are just like frozen in time. Because in these assemblies, these talks of mine, See, my story, your story, it's the story. It's the story of young men and young ladies trying to figure out what we want to achieve and what we want to become. And we're having to face and weigh the waters of the adversity of our home life and the challenges of our culture and the challenges of the peer pressures of the, of the situations that we're all dealing with in schools and our community. But I promise you, every one of you, you were born from greatness. And that's not a talking point. And when I say that your life's going to be a masterpiece, when it's all said and done, we're all going to paint some kind of picture, like it, love it, or leave it. The question is, what kind of picture will you paint with your life? What's that final stanza, that final chapter, when, when we grow up and as we look back in our past and the things we accomplished and achieved, what will that picture be like? Will it be a beautiful masterpiece or will it be one that there's regrets and there's, and, there's, and there's pain because you knew that you left some out there on the field and you didn't work hard and you were complacent and you compromised yourself? Let me ask this question as we get started because I, I can, it's very interactive. I ask a lot of questions and that's why I had y'all raise your hand because I need you. When I say things, right, and if it, it affects you and if it impacts you, I know some of the times too well when we're in high school, we care so much about the opinions of the people around us. We want to act and talk and look a certain type of way to fit in with certain groups and crowds and clicks of people. 
But in this talk today, you and me, like I don't care about the people to your left or to your right. Like we're in this together, absolutely. But I'm here for each one of us individually, young and old alike. I don't care if you're just a high school student. And even if you're here, you're an adult, you're a parent, or you're an administrator, you're here. Like you're here for a reason. Because I promise you, we are better together. But right now, in this talk, it's you and me living life. And so when I ask these questions, I know sometimes we have this image and we have this this, this identity and this certain image that we've been maintaining and that we don't want to necessarily always raise our hand because what will everybody else think about me? I don't care about that. I mean, this is your journey. You, you can't let the opinions of people hold you hostage. You can't let the opinions of the people around you dictate what you want to achieve and what you want to become. Because I promise you guys, as you pursue, as you go through high school, and as you get on to college, no one is ever going to care more about your future, more about what you want to become and what you want to achieve than you. You're in control of your life. First question I want to ask all of you, right? How many of you in here, I want, to, I want to kind of wind this back around a little bit to the story to all of you guys. How many of you sitting in these seats right now, as you sit here, do you come from either a broken, a fractured, a separated, but your biological mom and dad, they're not together right now. Raise your hand. How many come from a divorced family, a separated family? Absolutely. Came out half of us in every school that I go to. That's about the percentages that I see. And how many of you that come from that broken family? Because I did too. I come from a fractured, a splintered family, and it rocked me to the floor. But how many of you that just raised your hand that said you come from that, that broken, that fractured family? If you were 100% real, raw, and truthful with yourself, how many of you would say, you know what, it's affected me, it's angered me, it's frustrated me, it's caused me to feel and act some type of way in my story so far today? Raise your hand. How many of us, right? Lots of us. See, I come from a little place called Kokomo, Indiana, it's where I live right now. To all the old folks in here, it's not just a Beach Boys song. I live there. Growing up, though, I was from Marion, Indiana, and I come from a family of four, and it was mom, dad, sister, and me. And my father, when I was a young man, my dad was always this role model, this icon, this superhero in my life. I looked up to my father in such a way, like he could do no wrong in my eyes. Like he was everything to me, literally. He was this role model that I looked up to. And the thing about my pops is, is this. My dad, he never, ever sugarcoated really anything. He was real, and he was raw, and he was honest. And the thing about my father, as a young man growing up, I remember vividly in like the third and the fourth grade, he would always say things to me like this, like Nathan, this world out here, it's a dull, dull world. And what he was meaning by that, he said, Nathan, listen, no one's going to spoon feed you your dreams and your goals. And at the end of the day, he would always say, you can go through middle school in high school and cut corners if you want to and do just enough to get by if you want to and use your little charisma and use your little personality and do just enough to get to the next grade and that may work for a while but one day when you grow up and as your world continues to expand all the handouts are going to go away and if you don't build your future with hard work and good choices if you don't take control of your life one day you're going to turn around and you will have nothing but if you build it no one can take it you're in control of your life. And my dad was telling me stuff like that. Literally, when I was in the third grade, man, I remember as I grew up and as I was kind of trying to figure out this journey called life, because see, life, man, it's a funny metaphor, but it's pretty true. And, and you guys here being here like next to the ocean, you guys can maybe get this, the, the, the magnitude of what the ocean looks like. See, first off, we rewind and say this. I'm from Indiana, and let me all tell you all this. Don't take for granted. The ocean is way better than corn, y'all. For real. It was, I, told, I told the other group the other day, my wife and my kids are here, and uh, it, I know you guys have some storms, and it gets a little cold sometimes in, the, in January, December, and all that time around you guys. But like, even when the rain came in the last couple of days, my wife and I were on the beach, man, like, ah, this is great. We were here in like, I think February, last year, two years ago, everybody in parkas and like fur coats and like cold, and me and my wife like laying on the beach like, this is great. Don't take for granted this ocean up in here, y'all. But anyways, I wanna say this to all of you guys, man. As you have grown up so far, your life, we're all like this little fish. Anybody in here ever go to, maybe this is like a Midwest Indiana thing, but any of you ever go to fairs or, or to like 
carnivals, and you win the little goldfish in a little like plastic bag. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right, as a kid? Okay, did anybody ever win one of those? Raise your hand. Does yours die? Mine too, man. So I don't feel as bad right now, man. It's like there's something about that goldfish and that little plastic bag, man. It's, they're setting you up for failure. But what I'm saying is this. Growing up in life, when we were in elementary and middle school to high school to college to the great unknown called our future, we're like this little goldfish, man. And as we grow up, we go from a, a little goldfish bowl, we get a little bit older, we go to middle school, and we get put in this pod. Our world gets a little bit bigger. And then we go through middle school, and we come to high school, and that pod turns into a lake. And then we get through high school, and we go to college, into our future, into our careers. We get thrown into the oceans of life. And I didn't quite get this growing up. But see, we can't stop our borders getting bigger. We can't stop our Surround, surroundings from expanding. Like it, love it, or leave it. We're going to grow up and it will be seek or swim. Predator or prey. Will we learn the life tools to continue to live healthy, focused, and successful futures? And for me, when my dad was telling me, Nate, you can cut corn if you want to, but one day all the handouts are going to go away, as I got a little bit older in middle school, Middle school, before the scooter laws got real strict, when I was in middle school, uh, you could be like 12 or 13 and get a scooter before they realized that, that every person who lost their license for drinking and driving would just go get a scooter and they were really fast. And so they're like, you got a license, you got an insurance. Before a lot of that happened, I was like in the fifth, sixth grade wanting to get a scooter real bad. We didn't have a lot of money though. I don't come from a lot of money at all. And I wanted a scooter though because everybody kind of was happy when I didn't get them. And so I remember one summer, when all my friends were ripping and running and out there having a great summertime and hanging out and doing this, like I wanted a scooter really bad, right? And so, like an eight, eight scooter, you know what I'm saying? Like scooter, scoot, right? Whatever. Terrible scooter. It was terrible. But I remember one summer, I decided that I was going to save all the money that I could. And so one summer, all my own, fifth, sixth grade, listen, I, I mowed yards, I raked some leaves, I was paying garages, I saved every dollar, every quarter, every nickel, every dime, every penny. I saved $2,000, right? And I walked into this little scoop scoop shop. I gave them the money. Take my scooter. Eight, 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 right? Love my little scooter. I had that stinking thing for three days, and on the third day, bam! Dude, I told you. And dude, I was hot. Like, I worked hard for the scooter. And my dad, the thing about my father, he was always trying to be philosophical. He was always trying to make everything a life lesson than a principle of how can you grow. And I knew when my dad showed up, when my scooter was broke, he didn't give me a day or two or nothing. He said, son, let me ask you a question. I was like, what, dad? Because I was hanging, right? He's like, what did you learn working all summer, saving all this money, and you wrecked your scooter after three days? I was like, dad, you want to know your philosophical answer? It's real simple. Bro, I should have hit the brakes. Like I wasn't trying to hear it, but my dad was trying to teach me the importance of hard work and choices. I remember as I got a little bit older, I got a little bit older, and about that same time frame, it was about the sixth, seventh grade. I was like, Dad, I think I want to play ball. I want to play. I want to hoop, man. Indiana is a pretty big basketball state. Supposedly, I don't know why, because we win nothing in life. And this one, I was wanting to start playing basketball, right? Because everybody was trying to get into sports, and I was trying to figure out my flow and what I wanted to achieve. And I was like, I want to play ball, right? Now listen, I didn't know at that point in time that I was only going to grow up to be five foot seven ish. I'm like five six and three quarters, y'all. Like I'm very vertically challenged. I get it. But as a kid, man, I had hopes of the NBA. I was like, Dad, I want to hoop. He was like, Cool, son. Again, we didn't have a lot of money. My grandparents, they were kind enough to pour this piece of concrete for me in my hometown and in my backyard. We got this piece of concrete poured right. And then my dad, he bought this telephone pole and he stuck this telephone pole on the ground. And then I always used the word janky and I figured out the word in janky is a real word, but we didn't have a nice goal, like a gorilla goal. We had this old janky old backboard and rim, right? And I walk out there with my father. I'm excited, role model, icon, hero, I'm playing ball. He's like, son, you're supposed to put the ball in the goal. And I'm like, yeah, dude, I know that. He's like, I'm gonna stop you. Okay, I didn't quite understand what I'm gonna stop you meant to the extremity. And he checked up, and I'm getting ready to play with my, my icon. I shoot it, my dad goes, wow! Dude, for two hours, true story. I should have saw you early yesterday. 
my dad beat the brakes off of me. Like, I didn't make one stinking bucket after two hours, and I was demoralized, and I would get the ball and show my dad, wow, and I walk off that court. I vividly remember this, like it was, it's ingrained in my brain. I see it right now, the ball, wow, like he just smoked me, right? And I walked off this court, leaking tears and stop, emotional meltdown. But my mom was watching, right? She came out the house. Yes, she did. And she was like, Tim, why wouldn't you let your son make one bucket? I'm like, yeah, yeah, one bucket. I still to this day remember what my father said to me. He looked with my, to my mother and he looked at me with the most serious tone of voice that I've probably ever heard my father. And he said, my son used to understand he'll probably be, never be the most gifted. He'll probably never be the most talented. There will always be people in his life that are more qualified than him. But my son has to understand at a young age, he never has to compare himself to anybody more gifted, more talented, or qualified. Because at the end of the day, hard work works. And hard work can outwork any gifted, talented, qualified person. Hard work can always persevere. Don't compare yourself to anyone, son. And you're always going to face challenges in adversity. No matter what dream, no matter what goal, no matter what you want to pursue, pursue to become, there's always going to be objects and obstacles standing in front of you. And my dad looked at my mother and he said, my son needs to learn to see the problem, identify the problem, and don't get stuck on the problems in life to figure out the solution. My son will refuse to quit. And really, even at this conference, I can, I must, I will. I will not settle. I know that I'm gifted. I know that I'm talented. I know that if I put my, my hands and my feet and my resources to whatever dreams that you have, it's yours for the taking. Regardless of our home life, regardless of our, our, our community, at the end of the day, I promise you, from the front to the back, left to the right, you're in control of your life. And that's just a fact, show. But for me, life is full of ups and downs. Mountains and valleys. And I remember as I got a little bit older, my parents set me down. I want to have a family meeting. Family meetings to me were normally, I was kind of conditioned that family meetings. My dad used to love to surprise me with like vacations or maybe a shopping trip. And he would always have a family meeting so he could like, I think, just get like, Dad, yeah, you're amazing. Yeah, you're awesome. So he called a family meeting. I'm stoked. Like, let's go. Can't wait. When I walked into this family meeting, it was a little bit different. My dad was to my right, my mom across from my sister to my left. My back was to the stove, to the fridge, to the sink. You see, truthfully, I call them moments of impact. We've all had them. There are moments in all of our lives growing up, young and old alike, when single events, single occurrences happen in our circle, in our space, in our life, that will forever be marked in time when you remember every detail when something happened, good or bad, when that happened to you. For some of us, we won championship, we ace tests. When that thing happens still today, you remember every detail. It's like the description words are more vivid. The people around you, the details are just more vibrant. You remember every detail when something good and when something bad happens. For me, bad things of parents divorcing and grandparents passing away of cancer. For all of us, every one of us in here, specifically all of us, we have these moments of impact in our lives when something happens that still to this day, it's forever ingrained in our head. And for me, I walked into this family meeting and my dad's to my right, my mom across from my sister to my left, my back to the stove, to the fridge, to the sink, the wooden table that I was sitting at. I vividly remember it. I hated the table because it was extremely heavy. My dad had built this table. It was handcrafted. It was beautiful. But I hated it because we moved a lot and my dad would never get the moving crew. He always got the name crew. Hated the table. And the decorations on my kitchen wall were the most hideous, disgusting, ugly, archaic, 1970 faded pieces of archaic ceramic fruit. Like, what are those, y'all? Like, whose kitchen's ugly? Anybody in here? And really, mom ain't here, you're like, oh, my kid's cool, right? So y'all just got break. Now, my kitchen was hideous. My mom didn't know. Like, she didn't know what she was doing. Anyway, I remember the details because mom looked at dad and dad looked at me and my, my mom and my sister. 
my dad began to share about this divorce. And it floored me because my, my parents never fought in front of me. They never argued or fought ever in front of me. Maybe I was just naive enough to think as a sixth and seventh grader that I had a picture perfect family. And when I'm saying like they never fought in front of me, like I, I'm not overstating it, I'm not embellishing it, I'm not exaggerating it. Not one time do I remember my parents ever having fights. But growing up, I was never allowed to go into their, their bedroom. And the reason is, is because see, I'm very high strung if you don't know. I have one speed, and as a young man growing up, they always say they hear one speed, it's squirrel. It's kind of true, man, even today. Like, I wear people out. I'm here to communicate, and you're like, oh my gosh, this dude is like, go, 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 go. But as a young kid, then I broke everything. So my parents were like, hey, our bedroom, it's off limits. We have a place where there's peace and quiet, but we can woosaw, and we can turn you off, baby. I get it. But the truth is, the reason I wasn't allowed in my parents' bedroom, and this isn't for everybody, but behind my parents' bedroom doors were the verbal, the mental, the emotional abuse happened in my family. And behind the parents' bedroom doors were the drugs and the alcohol happened in my family. And as I grew up and as I began to ask questions about the truth that my, my father wasn't fiction perfect and he had a terrible addiction and drugs and alcohol and there was a lot of abuse and there was a lot of stuff that was going on. I remember that I looked at my father and I literally remember I looked at him and I said, I'm never going to be like you. I'm going to prove to you I don't need you in my life. But what I learned to do, and even though my parents didn't intentionally mean to teach me this, I watched them, and I watched how they never fought and they never were honest with their feelings and their emotion, emotions. I learned by watching them how to put on my fake face too. I could put on my mask. And I could go through life and I could go through the challenges of a young man growing up and I could walk the walk and talk the talk and on the surface, on the surface, it would look like everything was picture perfect. But behind the mask, there were hurts and there was pain. As a young man growing up, that sixth, seventh, eighth grade year, I learned to put on this mask and not let anybody in below the surface. I would shield and I would mask the hurts and the pains. If I could write a picture, if I, not a write, if I could hand you all a picture, if I could get every single one of you in here a picture that would describe my life, the picture that I would hand you that would be the description of my life at that moment, it would be me sitting on the beach with the most white, pristine sand, and the ocean waters would be crystal clear and blue, and the sunset would be majestic yellows and oranges. The picture would look beautiful, but below the ocean waters was darkness and depths and predators and prey and it hurts and these emotions, and I was screaming, but I was silent. But as a young man growing up, I didn't know that honestly it's okay to not be okay. I didn't know as a young man growing up that you know what, we're all from the front to the back, every person in here, we are all beautifully broken somehow, some way. We all got stuff. But I wore this mask. And I wouldn't let anybody really know socially, emotionally, the hurts and the pains that I was dealing with. I didn't know that there was freedom and the, the healthiest way to grow and to develop is to talk and to communicate about our stuff and that we're not the only one that's dealing with stuff. We've all got stuff. But man, I would wear my mask and I would keep everybody at an arm's reach distance and I didn't know that even though I thought I was keeping my safe, myself safe from being hurt emotionally and socially and I didn't want to be real with people because I was so afraid of fears of rejection and all the stuff that was going on in this head of mine, I would wear the mask and I would keep everybody at an arm's reach distance but I didn't know the very thing that I thought was protecting me was the very thing that can hold me hostage. And when I talk about this math, I want you to be real and be honest with me. And I don't care who's around you, you and me in this moment. How many of you young men and young ladies and even the older people in here, when I talk about a mask and the fake faces and acting like everything's okay on the surface, but really you understand exactly what I'm talking about, that sometimes below the surface and behind the mask, there's a lot of hurts and a lot of, there's a lot of pains that people don't know about. Raise your hand. What am I? Yeah, man, in every school that I go to, from coast to coast, hundreds of thousands of students that I've been interacting with, so many of us who wear this mask because we think the mask is keeping us safe. And I've learned the hard way through the 
rest of the story of my life that that mask and that fear of trying to act and talk and look a certain type of way and fit in with some groups and crowds and cliques of people because of the peer pressure of what will they all think about me. I see social media and on the Instas and on the Snapchats and the Facebooks. Everybody takes these pictures and they, they filter it. Everyone likes it so picture perfect. But at the pressure that we face, that's not real life, man. And that below the surface in all of our lives, we have stuff. And wearing the mask never is going to help us to be successful and to be healthy and to grow socially and emotionally. Because pressure builds and pressure busts pipes. And when we hold this mask on, the social and the emotional pressure that grows, it slowly develops. And in the future, there's danger, destruction, and disasters that arise. You see, I've learned that when we don't use the number one tool, the number one tool we as humanity have is our ability to communicate, our ability to talk, our ability to express ourselves, and our ability to literally speak up and speak out when we're struggling with things socially and emotionally. Because at the end of the day, I thought I was the only one dealing with stuff. And so I was intimidated to let myself, my stuff know, to trust in caring adults or to good friends, those accountability partners that I had, those people that, that had my back. But I realized, man, we've all got stuff. Let me ask you, I want you to be real with me, right? Be honest, be truthful, be absolutely with you and me right now. How many of you in here, if you were 100% real with you, sometimes in your story, in your personal journey, when you're not with your friends, and you're by yourself, and you're in the bedroom, and you're looking in the mirror, or you're getting ready for school in the morning, in the bathroom, when you're by yourself, if you are honest with yourself and transparent with yourself, sometimes you feel like you're all alone and nobody really understands really who you are and what you're facing. Raise your hand. Yeah, man, lots of us do. See, for me, the more I began to share and to communicate and to talk about the social, the emotional, the feelings, the challenges that I was having with trusted caring adults and parents and friends and those people in my circle, you know what I began to realize, man? They identified with me because they had stuff too. And then I began to realize that we're all beautifully broken somehow, some way. And I didn't need to be embarrassed or intimidated or ashamed to talk about my stuff because we've all got stuff. And I promise you, we're all better together. We are all better together. Not one of you from the front, the back, the left, to the right are meant to be an island. What I mean by that, you're not supposed to have to do this thing by yourself. See, I need us to understand, we need some self-belief. I need you to understand and to believe in yourself, but ultimately, we can't do it by ourselves. We need our friends, we need coaches and mentors, and at the end of the day, there's a lot of times it's our own pride, it's our own guilt, it's our own um, fear of being honest and real. We're afraid to use the tools and the resources that we have. And what happens again, behind the mask, pressure can build and pressure bust pipes. See, as I've traveled, I've been able to identify these five ways, and there's more, I'm sure. But there are five ways this pressure in our culture, in our generation, is beginning, that pressure is beginning to bubble over and beginning to affect us in serious ways. When this all began to happen, I'm gonna come back to those five ways this pressure comes out. But when my mom and my dad got divorced and I wore my mask and I was suppressing the hurts, the pains, the mental, the struggles of life, the challenges, and I wasn't talking and I was being very surface with everybody. I had some really good friends at the time. I had a young man named Jared and I had a young man named Jordan. Jared, he wanted to become a pharmacist. Jordan wanted to go to the army. And if I could have become and achieved anything in that moment, I loved photography. I love traveling and I love animals. You put those together, my dream was to be a photographer for the National Geographic or a marine biologist. Those were my dreams. And I had those real friends next to me. I mean, real friends that had my back. How many of you in here would say that you got a best friend? Raise your hand. Like a bestie, right? Your bro, your, your bestie, best, whatever you want to call it, whatever slang word, for a guy, for a girl, whatever your language is, right? See, let me all tell you something. 
importance of best friends. See, who you surround yourself with matters. And I know sometimes we as students, we can get really defensive when moms and dads and, and mentors or teachers are trying to, to maybe give you some words of knowledge and they see you ripping and running with the wrong crew and the wrong, with the wrong crowd. But the truth is, who you surround yourself with matters. They're going to affect you. They're going to impact you. Like it, love it, or leave it. They're going to influence you, good or bad. And so who you surround yourself with matters. And growing up, I had some great friends. I had Jared and I had Jordan. I mean, they were, they were those real friends. Like, real friendship is this, y'all. If you didn't know, I bet you know, let me just describe it to you this way and paint this picture. See, if I was growing up in this community, what's your name? What is it? Yeah. What is it? Purple. Is that your name? Watch this. If I was from this community and you were my guy, my people and your people. And we were growing up together. And your friends and your family, you my friends and my family. And as a young man, we grew up and we played games together. And as a young man, you would come over to my house and I would go over to your house and we would live life together, right? We would, we would have a deeper friendship than most. And I would know your dreams and your goals and you would know my dreams and my goals. I would be the guy that when you thought old girl was cute, you sent a text message to her, and I'm like, yeah, bro, we'll talk to her. I would be the dude when old boy disrespected you, and you're like, yo, Nate, I wanna go smash you. are like, nah, bro, you can't. Like, my job, real friendship is this, y'all. I'm supposed to, because I know your dreams, your goals, and what you wanna achieve, and what you wanna become, I'm supposed to do whatever it takes as we grow up together to make sure that you get to the next level, bro. And I'm gonna hold you accountable and call you on your stuff. I'm supposed to do the one that at all costs refuses to see you fail. That's real friendship, bro. I'm the one. If I see you making poor choices and poor decisions, bro, I'm not your best friend because you have to always like me. I'm your best friend because I refuse to watch you make choices and decisions that can hurt and harm your destiny. And I'm supposed to do whatever it takes. Now, it doesn't mean I can always save it. It doesn't mean I can always fix it. That's not my job. But I always can speak up and I can speak out and I can be fearless and tell you about yourself because you give me that position in your life as your best friend. And I refuse to see you not living in life. That's real friendship, y'all. And growing up, I had Jared and I had Jordan. I had real friends. But as I went from middle school to high school, the pressure of the culture fitting in. Going from middle school to high school, it was from 700 students to 2,700 students. And my sister, she was four years older than me. So as I went through middle school, she went through high school. And when I was in the fifth grade, she was a freshman, sixth grade, sophomore, seventh grade, junior, eighth grade, senior. And I remember as, as I got to the high school, I had this pressure that I wanted my high school days to have a certain kind of like reputation, and I wanted to leave behind a certain kind of legacy, and, and I wanted to fit in, I wanted to be part of the movers and the shape of the school, the peer pressure that we all face, the popularity, and all of these things. And so my freshman year, as I was going again from a, a smaller school to a larger school, back to that metaphor of from a lake, from a pond to a lake, that my, my borders were getting bigger. Man, my freshman year, I was in my doing marine biology classes, I was doing photography classes, I was doing I was doing videography classes, I was doing everything that I, I needed to do to see my, my dream of becoming a photographer of the National Geographic of Alive. And I was getting straight A's, I had Jared and Jordan. I was actually voted my freshman year, going to be the most successful freshman in my class of, of 700 freshmen coming in from three different middle schools. I was driven. But after my freshman year, I kind of settled in it, and I looked at the overlay of my school and the pressure of the culture of fitting in. I remember I looked at Jared and I looked at Jordan and they weren't the most popular kids. They weren't necessarily the kids that were the movers and the shakers. They dressed, they dressed a little bit different. We didn't have all the nice stuff. And I realized when I looked at Jared and I looked at Jordan and I was like, man, if I keep ripping and running three more years with them, all of you, all of my classmates, everybody else in the school, they're never going to see me with the image that I needed all of you to see me with. So I decided one of the worst decisions that I've ever made transitioning from middle school to high school was I gave up the real friends that had my back. 
because they weren't going to give me the image and the perception that I wanted the rest of the school to see me with. And even though these real friends knew my hurts, my pains, my struggles, they truly were invested in me. I made one of the most selfish decisions that I ever could have made, and I cut them off, and I walked away from them, and I tried to find me new friends that would put me into a certain space and crowds. Listen to me, guys. Don't ever feel like you need to walk away from real friends that have your back to fit in with the culture of your school. Real friendship is hard to find. And if you've got friends that care about you, that value you, and yep, they may not always be your yes men and your yes ladies that say yes to every one of your ideas, and they actually are a voice that speaks up and speaks out and kind of is always going to be real with you. And even though you may not like it, and sometimes you don't always see eye to eye, best friends are always going to be best friends because they always like each other. Best friends go beyond that. It means I'm committed to seeing you win in life. That's real friendship. But for me, I cut them all. And mix that in with the peer pressure of the culture of the school transition, along with me wearing my mask and my social and my emotional hurts, there was a perfect storm brewing. See, I cut off those friends and I began to try to find a, a group of kids that were gonna give me the image that I wanted. And I met a group of kids and I met a community, but they, they didn't know my hurts, my pains, they, they didn't know me from, from my youth like Jared and Jordan, and they brought me into their circle. But they were kind of verbally abusive. They were, really, they were older than me, and yeah, they let me be a part of their crowd, but they didn't know my story, and I was kind of like the punching bags, verbally and emotionally, and they picked on me and they clowned on me, and see, one way, the pressure in our culture is surfacing. You see, we use the word bullying, and I think it's a very childish word, especially in high school and middle schools. So I like to be real, I'm a real guy. I'm real and I'm raw. I like to call bullying for what it really is. It's verbal, it's mental, it's emotional, it's abuse, and it's wrong. It's verbal, it's mental, it's emotional, it's abuse, and it's wrong. Bullying is verbal, mental, and emotional abuse. And really at the root of the bully, hurting people hurt. And as I began to get picked on and clowned on, see, truthfully, all these other students, they had their own stuff and their own struggles, and they were picking on me and clowning on me, but I wanted to fit in, and I was hurting too, so I joined in at times, and I would find people that I thought were weaker than me, and I would step on them verbally, mentally, and emotionally, and I began to realize and think that I could come to school, and I could take my worth and take my value by picking on people and getting my friends to laugh at my jokes. But at the end of the day, every day when I would go home and I would wake up in the morning and I would look in the mirror, picking on kids and being verbally, mentally, emotionally abusive to people, it never satisfied, it never met that emotional and social need that I had because you can never take your worth and take your value. One way the pressure behind the mask will build and will manifest itself into those around us is hurting people. Verbally, mentally, emotionally, physically, hurting people hurt people. And what I always say when I go to school and I'm really focusing in on bullying is this. At the end of the day, if you're in here right now and you're somebody that is verbally, mentally, emotionally abusive, at the end of the day, I would be great for you to have an epiphany and to say, you know what, I need to stop treating people this way. Well, let's be real, you probably won't. But what my real challenge to you is, is when you leave here, you go home, and you look in the mirror, I just want you to ask yourself this question. Why? Why do I really treat people the way I treat them? Because if you can get to the root of the why, you can begin to find out. Because most people who are hurting people verbally, mentally, emotionally, physically, and socially, and they're just hurting. And all across our country, there's an epidemic of these bullies all across our school picking on kids. The truth is that it's hurting people. And what I always share with the young men and young ladies who are getting picked on, I'm not saying it's right and it's fair that they treat you as okay, it's not. But don't allow the words to live rent free in your head. They're not picking on you and being verbally, mentally, emotionally abusive to you because they don't like you. They got their own stuff and their own struggle. And the more you begin to not allow those words to, to be a dagger and to, and to like an arrow shot into us, right? And the more that you can begin to let those words flow down off like water off the cup's back, that person, they're going to find somebody else because they're not trying to pick on you because they don't like you. They're looking for anybody who can feed their hurts because hurting people hurt people. 
One way that happens and manifests the pressure. You know another way? The social and the emotional pressure happens below the surface. And I know when I talk about it, not because I, I've read books and get educated about it necessarily, I have now today, I like in this field. But see, for some of us, when we wear this mask, and we're not being, and this is crazy, this thing is not being cooperative. When we wear this mask, below the surface of the hurts and the pains, that pressure finds its way out for some of us. We've seen it on TV, we've heard about it in our communities, we've, we see it on social media, but you know, sometimes we, we wear this mask and thoughts have given up and maybe nobody cares about me and I don't know how to deal with my hurts and my pains and my emotions and, and maybe I should just end it and maybe I should just take my life and maybe I should just commit suicide. And all across this country, we, we know it's an epidemic, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, something that's happening and here in our community, here in every other community that I go to, this is real and it's raw and it's firsthand because we've all been affected by this. And I talk about suicide, not because I read books to get educated about it, but I know what it was like when I was a sophomore and I was a junior and I was in this, this journey and I was dealing with the stuff below behind the mask and I was hurting kids and I wanted to be accepted and I was being picked on kids and being picked on my kids and I was hurting kids and one way that pressure was coming out was, was verbal, mental, and emotional abuse but then I began to realize I wasn't satisfied and I wasn't meeting the need and I wasn't fixing it and so it becomes to continue to try to come out and I heard of, of somebody in my community who had made a forever decision and they ended their life and I heard about it on this and that and so maybe, maybe making that decision is my answer and I talk about it because I've been there. I remember there was a time in my high school journey that I had climbed the ladder and I attempted. Let me ask this question. And I'm just being really gutter with this man because I, the more we talk about it, I promise you there is freedom and transparency. How many of you in this community, in here right now, from the front to back, the left to the right, in the last, in the last, we'll just say six months, have you heard one of your friends, one of your people, one of your peers, talking about, not you, but you've heard somebody, you've heard somebody talking about or entertaining the idea of maybe I should just commit suicide and just end my life. Raise your hand. What am I? What am I? No happy. Hold his hands high, right? You've heard students, yeah? It's so important for every one of us in here to understand that wearing the mask is never going to solve the hurts and the pains that you're feeling. Because some of those hands raised in here can represent some people in here, can represent, actually represent you. You can be like, honestly, I'm raising my hand because of somebody else, but, but really, I struggle too. You're not alone in this. But you've got to speak up, and you've got to speak out. And you've got to know that it's okay to not be okay. Because that pressure, socially and emotionally, both below and behind the surface, it's never going to be a lead. It's never going to find safe ways out unless you talk. And what's so important for us, first and foremost, is to make sure that all of us here, that we're being healthy, socially and emotionally, and we understand the importance of communication. And just because you have thoughts of wanting to give up, and just because you're having thoughts of maybe, maybe get a firm decision, it doesn't make you weird, it doesn't make you strange, it doesn't make you different. There are so many people in our country and across this world who are battling and trying to figure out this exact same journey of social and emotional. And so just because you have that thought, don't be intimidated and shy and be so embarrassed to talk about it. No, no, no. You need to talk about it. They used to think for a long time we shouldn't talk about these things. But no, the more we talk about these things, there is freedom in our transparency. And the more we talk, you know what happens? We realize we're not the only person that has these issues and we recognize that I'm not really alone and even in my struggle, I can identify 
identify with friends and I can identify with people and we're better together. But when we don't talk, we isolate and we seclude ourselves and those thoughts begin to grow and those thoughts begin to expand and, 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 and ultimately sometimes we react and make a forever decision. All of you in here, first and foremost, that will never answer or solve any of the stuff that you feel about behind the mask. Talking is the most healthy way that we have. Finding healthy outlets, drawing, writing, working out, finding healthy ways to decompress the pressure. And then, for me to now really be specific, to empower some of you in here, especially in this I can mentality of JA. As you guys are going back into your schools, the ones that are here and all of you that have came just to come and you're here today, like your voice matters and you have the ability to impact, to affect, and to encourage and to inspire people around you. If you're in school and you see those people who are isolating and you see those people who are struggling, struggling, and they're using that language and all of you that raise your hands, you know what? I've, I've heard somebody talking about it. I've heard somebody like entertaining the idea. Listen, you have no idea how much your voice can impact them with words of encouragement, with talking to them about it. Don't be even afraid, honestly. Don't even be afraid to mention, hey, I can see that you're struggling. Are you contemplating and even thinking about maybe committing suicide? Don't shy away from that. Your job, if, if, if we're in this together, like it, love our family, in our schools, we're a family and we're better together. And when one of us are hurting, we're all hurting. We can all take the initiative and all make it our personal. You know what? This year, I'm going to not be so self-absorbed, but I want to continue to make sure the people around me, that they also know that their life speaks and they matter. And if I see somebody struggling, I'm going to go to them and let them know they're not alone. Because you have no idea how much influence your voice has. Words of encouragement change people's lives, man. There is power in words. You speak, I, I, my whole organization, I, it's called Your Life Speaks. I believe our lives, they speak, they scream, they shout. There is power in you and I as students making a huge difference just by communicating and just by talking and just by readily available to each other. Your life carries purpose. And when we're in school this year, man, if you see somebody struggling, don't shy away from them. Speak up and speak out. Encourage them to get help. Encourage them to let them know that they're not alone. And if you see it and you know it's, it, it's that serious situation, maybe don't be afraid to call 911. Don't be afraid to go to the teacher and the counselor because let's be honest, man, bro. If you were my best friend, right, and you were struggling, this is what real friendship is. If you were struggling and you're my guy and we're growing up together and I know that you're not okay and something's kind of off, my job, if I'm really going to put myself in your circle, in your sphere, and my job, if I know that I'm supposed to speak up to you, I'm supposed to talk to you, I ultimately want you to reach up, to reach out and to get help so you can take ownership and take the initiative. But bro, if you're not going to, I'm not your best friend because you have to always like me. If I got to stand next to you and I got to speak up and speak out for you and let somebody know you're struggling. I don't care how mad you get at me. I'm not your best friend because you have to like me. I'm your best friend because I refuse to see you be lost in this world. And I want your future to become real. And I will do whatever it takes. That's your friendship. And so it's so important, guys. Now listen, those friends you got, don't be afraid to step on those toes, man. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to upset them and how they feel about you because real friendship isn't always about liking each other. It's about a commitment that's deeper than that, that we're going to get to the next level. And for me, that pressure below the surface, not only does it come out with hurting people, hurting people. New pack. Life Not only. Not only. Does that pressure come out hurting people, hurting people? But also it comes out, some of us be bad with thoughts and giving up. Others of us, we, we struggle with self-harm all across this country. That epidemic of, of self-harming ourselves and cutting and burning. How many of you 
How many of you do you know a classmate? Do you know somebody in your community who has struggled with self-harming? I'm just gonna use this microphone. I Check. Perfect. Outstanding. How many of you in this school, and this, and all these schools, come on, can you turn me down just a little bit? I'm yelling at people. I've been yelling at you the whole day, probably. But how many of you do you know somebody who struggles with self harm? Yeah, man. You know why I talk about self harm? Not because I read books about it. I can count scars on my hands. I can see the marks still today when I was in high school. I had these emotions and these hurts and these pains that I couldn't quite express. And I didn't really know how to express them. I felt numb. And I felt like nobody understood me. And I heard and I saw others that were self-harming. And I remember the very first time that I burned myself. That pain made me feel alive. And that pain made me at least feel like I was still here. And then if I was honest and truthful with myself, I began to self-harm. And I would do it on places that I, others could see it. And so many people who are struggling with self-harming, they get so defensive when you say it this way, but I know that I know because I've been one of them. A lot of us, or some of us, we self-harm in places that we want others to see it because we feel invisible and we don't feel like we have a lot of worth and we don't feel like we have a lot of value. So we do it in places that even though it may be a strange look, a weird look, an indifferent look, at least it's still a look and somebody's seeing me and I don't care what they think about me. I just want somebody to know that I'm not invisible. So I act up and I act up, I do whatever it takes and then I condition myself as a coping mechanism and it became a habit and now I want to stop but I'm struggling because this became a way that I deal with my hurts and my pains. Some of us, that's why we do it. Others of us, we have to lack our self-worth and self-value. We don't think we deserve to not be in pain. There's a lot of reasons, but ultimately, it comes from behind, behind the mask. There are hurts and pain that we're afraid to talk about and identify, and that pressure has bubbled up, and it has turned into an outward appearance of self-harming. And if you're in here and you're battling with this, your own self, man, listen, I promise you, it's never going to solve what you're looking for. You'll wake up every day and you'll have that exact same boy, and that exact same deficiency. Talking always is the best solution. And I don't these things the hard way, y'all. You see, not only when I went to middle school to high school and I walked away from good friends and I began to compromise myself and I began to, to, to want so, so much for you to, to accept me and to care about me, I, I began to, to run around with the wrong crew and I started picking on kids and belittling kids and bullying kids and that didn't work and then I contemplated thoughts of into my life and, and then I was dealing with self-harm and then those friends, they were like, hey, hey, on the weekend, on the weekend, why don't you come over here and, and pop this pill and take this drink and do this and do that. And I remember as a young man, when I looked at my dad and I told my father, I'm never going to be like you because my dad, I found that he had a terrible addiction and all these things. I remember when I looked at my father and said, I'm never going to be like you. But here I was in my high school, in the peer pressure and in the community, wanting to be accepted behind the mask. The social and emotional struggles and pains were there. And I wasn't talking about them. And now I'm dealing with suicidal thoughts and self-harm and, and bullying kids and hurting people because hurting people hurt people. Now, there's these friends saying, hey, Nathan, pop the pill and take the drink and smoke this. And I remember there was a time as a sophomore that I began and I was like, you know what? I gave into the pressure and I began to compromise myself. And truthfully, growing up in middle school and high school, you hear the dangers of drugs and alcohol and how bad it is. You don't do this. You don't do that. You hear it over and over and here I was in this moment, and I was so caught up going to fit in so desperately with all of you. And I had all this stuff all behind the surface. And I remember vividly in my sophomore year, I compromised myself. And I gave in, and I, I went on that, that party on that weekend, and I popped the pill, and I got drunk, and I smoked, and I did my thing. And then, at the end of the day, and I'm going to be honest with y'all, like, when I first began experimenting with drugs and alcohol, I started it because I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be feel like I was accepted. Everybody in my community was doing it. But then I learned it 
a coping mechanism, that it was a way for me to deal with the hurts and the pains, and to get faded on the nights, and to get faded on the weekends, and I have to deal with my hurts and my pains, but I would wake up every single morning, and I was still dealing with those exact same social and emotional hurts, but now I have developed a new coping mechanism. See guys, talking about our stuff is always the answer. And the truth is, with the drugs and the alcohol, it's this, man, I started it, I'll be real, everybody told me the dangers of drugs and alcohol, but I, I, I smoked that weekend, and then I started drinking and smoking it, and I was hiding from teachers and friends and people around me, and what happened is, is it seemed kind of innocent when I first started, that weekend, the very first time that I popped my pill, and all of you in here, right, if, if any of you in here have experienced, experimented, or any of that, or any of Anybody that you know, right? There's that point in time that most of us always remember the first time that we compromised ourselves and we gave into the peer pressure. And for me, when I first began, it seemed so innocent, like I didn't, like I didn't overdose on drugs that night, and the world didn't fall apart, and and actually the party kind of seemed fun, and I felt like I was being accepted by people. Maybe this is a way for me to deal with my stuff, and maybe this is, it's no big deal. Everybody else is doing it, but this is what I realized. See, drugs and alcohol. And some of y'all are gonna laugh at this, but I'm so serious. See, drugs and alcohol, when we first begin, I like it into it like this. Like, it's a cute little bear cub. Like, rah, like, right? Like, no, 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 like, rah, like bear cub, right? Like, bear cubs, they are cute, they are cuddly. If, if mama bear wasn't around, and it was just you, and, and you walked up with a little cute little bear cub without the mama, like, ah, like, bear cubs are cute, cute, y'all. Like, when I first started experimenting with drugs and with alcohol, it seems so harmless. It seems so innocent. But as I grew up, and as that cute little addiction grew up and the, the bear cub grows up, see, I want to show you all a picture real quick. There's a picture of me. My freshman year, I'm going to be the most successful freshman in this class. Like, I'm, I'm at the beginning stage of middle school to high school. The pressure level behind the mask is beginning to mount. I'm, I'm beginning to develop very unhealthy ways of coping with my stuff socially and emotionally. Then I start experimenting with drugs and alcohol. I went from straight F's, y'all. I mean, straight A's to straight F's. My senior year, I skipped school 63 or 65 times my senior year. I don't even know how that's possible without getting kicked out. I guess I was a great manipulator. But I, I, I manipulated myself, and I went from straight A's and straight F's. And see, bear cows, man, when they're cute, and they're young, and they're cuddly, they're like, ah -ha! Like, for real. I went out to San Diego two years ago with my wife and my kids. I, I, I'll show you a picture of my wife and my kids a little bit later. I went to San Diego, everybody said, hey, when you go to San Diego, you gotta go to the San Diego Zoo. It's world renowned. So I went to the San Diego Zoo, and I came face to face with a panda bear cub. And listen, man, I, in Indiana, I come from kind of an inner city, city, kind of from the streets. I'm pretty gutter, I'm pretty raw. I, I feel like I'm kind of a tough dude, right? And uh, dude, I came face to face with this panda bear cub, and I know him like butt. I was like, ah! And I was like, honey, honey, honey. Get a picture. No, 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 no. A good one. Listen to me. I don't care how tough you think you are in this place. Let me put you face to face in front of a panda bear cub. And you know what you're going to do? I don't care how tough you think you are. You're like, ah They're cute, y'all. The problem is, bear cubs, when they grow up, and a grizzly bear cub isn't a grizzly bear cub, but it's a full grown mama bear, it's not cute, it's not cuddly. See, I began to feed him the drugs and the alcohol as my new coping mechanism. And what happened, this picture, the picture on your left, this picture on your left was me at 18 years old. Hold on, it's not working. There it is. Yeah, man. Dude, I'm 18 years old in this picture. I'm probably one heartbeat away from a drug overdose. My life is spiraling out of control. I'm getting kicked out of school. Behind the surface of the mass are all these hurts and these pains and I'm, I'm dealing with suicidal thoughts and self-harm and addictions and hurting people, hurting people. What happened to me is I got kicked out my senior year, right? And when I got kicked out my senior year, like I had kind of gotten labeled in my community as a failure, as a kid that couldn't get right. Like all those, I started stealing from people because you will steal to feed the bear. Like, you will steal to feed the bear, like, like, bears, 
Funny slide suit, right? I got time. I went, I went to Tennessee to the Smoky Mountains. Me and my family love to take these vacations, right? And I go to Tennessee with my wife and my kids, and again, I wanted to be a photographer for the National Geographic. It was like four years ago. So I always had this dream of like photography and animals, and I've got a picture of the panda bear. It's a true story. You've got it behind the glass. I've got a picture of a grizzly bear in Indianapolis who behind his cage. God. And my wife was like, hey, Nathan, hey, we want to go to the Smoky Mountains for our family vacation. I was like, great. It's Smoky Mountains is the largest black bear population in the United States. And I was like, honey, I want to get a picture of me and the bear and the lion. That's stupid idea. So we get to the Smoky Mountains, right? True story, true story. We first get there, I got my little camera on. We show up and uh, we're deep in the middle of the smoke because I'm talking like no signal, cell phones, mountain, mountain, on this little narrow road, we're in the middle of nowhere, and we're, we're cruising, right? I'm excited, it's my first day being there, and the car in front of me stops, and when he stops in front of me, he points to the right, and as he points to the right, I look right, and there's this black bear about 40 yards up into the side of the mountain, right? Now my first instinct, I jumped out the car. And now my wife wasn't okay with this at all. Zero. And as I started creeping on this bear, like in my brain, I created the formula. Listen, the bear can run twice as fast as me. That means I gotta keep the car twice as close as me. And if the bear chases me, as long as I get to the car and close the door, like I saw the YouTube videos, it may shake the car, but we're all gonna be okay. And if that happens, I will record it all. I will post it, we all win. I'm creeping on this bear. My wife, I don't care any of the story. I didn't care in the moment. I was caught up in the picture of the bear. I'm creeping on bear. I realized there was a moment. I'm farther from the car, closer to the bear. I have broken protocol. The bear sees me. It's not just the black bear. It is mama black bear. She has two bear cubs. And she is not okay. And she is snarling and turning. And my heart is beating out of my chest. And I'm like, Ch -ch 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 -ch. I was committed. Ch -ch 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 and I look at my wife, and I look at the bear. Listen, I cannot repeat to you what my wife was saying to me, because she was furious. And that bear snarled, and I looked at my wife, and it snarled, the bear, not my wife. She kind of like snarled. Dude, it lunged at me. I took off like a banshee. <laughs> like, I swear to you, I heard this black bear right behind me. The whole idea of taking pictures, stupidest idea ever, man. I'm running into my life. I get to the car, I close the door, back home to the back of the That's okay, I'm gonna deserve my wife, right? And then my heart was beating out of my chest, it was crazy. That stupid bear, it didn't even move. It was all on my head. But they tell me all down there, don't feed the bears. Why? Because if you feed the bear, the bear becomes and thinks that you're a food source. And drugs and alcohol, y'all, y'all, as you go through high school, I promise you, it's not going to be what you think it is. You begin to feed it. It's simple. It's popping a pill in high school. It's fitting it. It's smoking. It's drinking. Slowly but surely, as you grow up, I promise you, that bear cub, it won't be a bear cub. It will try to destroy your life. How do I know? I was kicked out of school at 18. 23 years old, living in my hometown. I went from being a young man who had the world with the palm of his hands to being a young man who 23 years old, no future, no hope. Struggling to work on the floor. It was a Friday night, a bunch of my friends that still that same friend circle, because I was, I was afraid to step away from unhealthy relationships. Hear me on that, y'all. If people don't have your best interests in mind, you cannot compromise yourself and let people hold you hostage because you're afraid of the opinion they will think about you because you're trying to be better, to achieve better, to have and to experience more. You cannot let unhealthy friendships and relationships hold you hostage because of the pressure of what people think about you. Real friendship, should, you should never have to apologize for wanting to do what's right, y'all. You should never have to say you're sorry for wanting to be better, to have better, to achieve better. And if the people in your circle are trying to clown on you and belittle you because you're trying to experience all that life has for you, those aren't your real friends, y'all. And don't let them hijack your destiny and your future. I was 23 years old. They said, hey, there's a big party you want to go? I said, let's go. Let's go to the party. Me and my friend, we got a half bottle of whiskey. We go to the party. We split the half, we split actually a whole bottle of whiskey. We go to the party. I'm 23. The party's winding down. They said, hey, we're going to go to the bar. Do you want to go? I'm like, yeah, let's go. 
They said, do you want to drive? I said, no, I can't drive. I had just got a DUI a few months before this. But I'll go. We go to the bar, and it's a big, crazy time, and the bar's closing down, and I'm extremely drunk. I had, I had 10 shots of tequila at the time, so half a bottle of whiskey, 10 shots of lit up, y'all, I'm gone. They said, hey, they need to be after party. You want to go to the after party? I'm like, yeah, let's go. And they said, well, you know TJ real well. And that's where the party's going to be at, so why don't you? Here's his keys. He's not there yet. Why don't you take his keys and go get the party ready? And I'm like, cool, great. I, I can do that. I get on my phone. I call Priscilla. She's going to be my designated driver. I said, hey, Priscilla, I need a ride. Can you come get me? And she shows up to get me, and I bought this case of beer bottles. And, and uh, as we're leaving, my buddy Mike stops and says, mate, you're not driving. I said, no, bro, she's my DD. Priscilla shows up and she's going to take me to TJ's house and, and I walk out that car, out, out in the parking lot and, and as we get to her car, I remember putting the case of, of beer bottles in the back passenger seat. But somewhere in the, case, in the process, in the chaos of all the people leaving and going to the bar, Priscilla gave me the keys to her car. And I remember getting into the driver's seat and I put on my seatbelt and we took off. When I talk about moments of impact, moments that still today you can remember every detail when something happened in your circle. As I stand in front of all of you, I vividly can hear it, I remember it, I can picture it. I hear her voice and she simply said, TREAT! Then it was black and I was in a helicopter. And I woke up and I was in a hospital bed. The police officers were talking to me, asking me questions about Priscilla because her cell phone, it was locked. Her ID, it wasn't in her purse. And she was fighting for her life. And nobody, nobody knew who she was until I woke up and I could say who she was and identify who she was. And as I woke up and the police were asking me questions, and I say, is Priscilla Owen, that she lives here? What's happening? I said, what's wrong? We can't tell you anything, you're not family. My mama had showed up at the time and my ankle was throbbing and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so caught up and I, I remember like, like so many things are running through my head in a moment. Here I am, 23 years old. At 23, many of you should be graduating college at 23 years old. At 23 years old, the people in this room right here, right now, if you're in school at 23, you should be finishing your first four years of education, pursuing your dreams, your goals, your destinies. And I had that same intention when I was a freshman, but I began to compromise myself. And I began to refuse to take off my mask. And I was scared to talk about my hurts, my pains. And all these things combined, combined it together. They are like a compound fracture, man. I have social and emotional hurts, plus also there's peer pressure in my community. I was afraid to talk about it. I never had anybody get real and raw and gutter with me and try to encourage me that it's okay to not be okay and we're beautifully broken. Somehow, someway, we're all going to be better together. Like, I was just struggling with all of this. Now here I am at 23 years old and this action is happening. And for some reason, the police didn't arrest me right then and there. They released me to go home with my mother. They said, Miss, 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 Miss Hart, my mother. We'll be in contact with you soon. I'm like, what's happening? So we can't tell you. I remember getting into the car with my mom and sitting in the seat. And as I sat in the seat, like I just wanted my mom. Like, like I just like finally I took off the mask and finally like I like I just wanted her. I wanted, you know, why is it that this is for so many of us? It's not to we find ourselves in a very adverse situation. Do we want to get honest with ourselves? If we as people could learn to understand, let's be proactive and take the mask off before things get too bad, before we begin to make poor choices and poor decisions. Like we're better together and we're not alone. Let's let's get real with each other at the beginning of this thing, right? Let's let's identify some of our struggles at the beginning before this pressure comes out in unhealthy ways. But here I am and I'm like, Mom, and she's like, hey, what are you talking to? Because my sister was a nurse, and when the accident happened, my sister got a phone call. So the time my mom had showed up, my sister had identified and told my mom what had happened because the police report, the ambulance report. And the police report said when they arrived on the scene, and the paramedics said when they arrived on the scene, initially they radioed in, they could only see one passenger in the vehicle. And the amount of impact that we hit the tree, of how far the car was crushed in, there was no brake marks, no skid marks, no signs of me trying to stop. It was we're going 60 to 63 miles an hour, and boom! And upon impact, my hands were on the steering wheel, and I snapped the steering wheel, and I knocked me unconscious, and my foot was on the gas pedal. And upon impact, my foot on the gas pedal, I shattered my ankle. And Priscilla didn't put on her seatbelt. She was through forward like a rock. And the beer bottles that I put in the back seat, they flew forward too. And they made impact to with the windshield. And the paramedics, when they arrived, they couldn't see one person in the vehicle because we still had slid to the floor. And her neck was broken and she was fighting to survive. 
And when all of a sudden, Daniel, your life's about to change. And when that happens, instantly I, I realize not only now has my choices affected my whole life. I mean, honestly, the fear of, like, my life is over, what's going on, like, she has to live, there's no way this is going to happen. I remember being a freshman as a sophomore, such potential, but I compromised myself. I, I didn't take seriously the, the struggles that I was having, and I was just so caught up with trying to fit in and maintain these images. And, and that not only had it affected me, now there's another family affected. And so I get home, and I call the police, and I call the hospital. And I'm, I'm calling everybody, like, like what, is she going to be okay? I know she's going to be okay. And, and they wouldn't tell me anything. There was a family, so I remember I sat up all night, and I, the newspaper had ran a story, and the newspaper said two life find a Parkview Hospital, one fighting for their life. I was like, you know what, the paper's going to let me know, the paper will tell me if she's okay or she's not. I know she's going to live, and I sat in this driveway all night, and I was making every deal with myself, let her live, I'm going to change. I'm making every deal with whoever we hear me in the universe, let her live, I'm going to change. And the paper came at 2 a.m. in the morning, and it was like a movie. Everything went into slow motion, and the paper man drove by and rolled the window down, and everything slowed down, and the paper hit the ground. As it hit the ground, I jumped up, and I grabbed it, and I ripped it open, and I read three words, and the headline simply said this, crash, victim, die. And at 23 years old, This isn't working. Why is it not working? And I took for granted that feeding the bear cub, it's innocent. What happened? I promise y'all this, if I could go back to when I was a sophomore, and I had been in front of many communicators talking about dangerous drugs and alcohol and all these things, I never would have begun to feed the bear. I never expected a million years to happen to me. I promise you that cute little cut of the bear cut that is becoming for some of us maybe, possibly, a coping mechanism to deal with your hurts and your pains, it never will solve it. Pressure plus pipes. And for me, the pressure of my high school journey, man, I wouldn't talk socially and emotionally about my stuff. And I battle with hurting people, hurting people. And I battle with suicidal thoughts. And I, I battle with self-harm. And I, I battle with drugs and with alcohol. And ideally, all of those things, all of those struggles, they were just like the cough of the flu or of the cold. At the end of the day, they were all trying to mask and counterfeit the real hurts that I just needed to speak up and to speak out and to talk about my stuff. Part of the story, which is pretty... Pretty amazing. Her family, three days after my accident, they wanted me to contact them. What do you say? I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm scared to death. I pick up the phone and I call. And they said, Nathan, listen to me. Before you say a word, Priscilla had shared that she was coming to get you to be your designated driver. We don't know what happened that night. We know she was sober. She was supposed to be your DD. We don't know why she gave you those keys. I said, it's my fault. I'm sorry, so. And they said, no, baby, yes, you're responsible. And yes, you made some terrible choices, but we don't solely feel like we can only blame you. Our, our daughter knows better. And they said this to me that forever has changed my life. They, they radically forgave me in a way that I still don't even comprehend today. And for a whole other talk, for another venue, for another place, but his family forgave me. And they said, I want you to know, Nathan, you're like family to us. We don't want one stupid choice to destroy your lives, too. But we're asking you to do two things. Please don't let our daughter die for nothing. And try to make the world a better place. But who didn't forgive me was the state of Indiana. And at 23 years old, I found myself being charged with reckless homicide. I found myself being sentenced to 15 years in prison at 23 years old. And this is a lot of that what I just shared in this verse. And you guys have been sitting like a movie, man. You know, there's a lot to do with me. I'm so, like, just we're living life. But all of that surmounted in, in, in 2009 when I was 23. I'm 34 now. Do I look 34? Perfect. But listen to me. In 2009, when my back was against the wall, and now my choice had affected other families, and I was doing socially and emotionally with a lot of stuff below the surface, 
and I got sentenced to 15 years in prison. Listen to me, every single one of you in here, listen, I know sometimes our home life isn't the best. I know sometimes we all are facing pressure of, of our community and fitting in, and we're trying to figure out what things are like. Listen, when I went to prison, it would have been real easy for me to say, you know what, I had made too many mistakes, I had been suicidal and self-harming, and all the mental and emotional stuff that was, was kind of off balance, and I hadn't talked, and, and, and now the drugs and the alcohol, and now another family had, had affected them. It would have been really easy to say, you know what, I give up, life's just too tough. But I remember something, I remember something that even though me and my father didn't always see eye to eye because I was hurt and I was emotional. I remember when he used to smack his basketball off my face and he said this to me all the time. He said, as long as there is breath in your lungs, there is hope in your heart and at the end of the day, your circumstances never have to define you. You are what you do, not what people say. And at the end of the day, hard work works, make good choices, good things happen. So at 23 years old, with my back against the wall, it would have been easy to say, you know what, I give up. Life's just too difficult. You know what I did? I took control of my situation and my life. And literally, I decided there was a promise that I wanted to keep to a family of trying to make a change in the world and impact a generation. And so what I did was I literally wrote the words, change the world, and I slapped them on my little prison wall. And I began to realize something. Make good choices, good things happen. Make good choices, great things happen. Do what you're supposed to be doing. Good choices will always create opportunities for us to win. Good choices will always position us in life to win. It's as simple as this. We can boil things down to just this. Make a good choice, great things happen. Make a poor choice, negative things are going to happen. But I had to come to terms with something else. You see, I know in life, we all face adversity and challenges. Some of us, for me, I was allowing things that I had no control of to control me. I was allowing things from my past that I had no say so, no influence in, no, no reason or rhyme for. Like, I just had to deal with them. Like, I didn't ask my mom and my dad to get divorced, right? But I was allowing things that happened to me in my past to control me. Some of us, man, things happen to all of us. We've all been faced adversity somehow, some way that we didn't ask for, we didn't want to be a part of, and it was brought right in front of us, and we have to deal with it. And you're like, what do I do with this? I don't want to do anything with this. I didn't ask for this. And I know in our generation, as young people all across this nation, we as students are faced with adversity of our home lives and the pressures of, of, of social lives and the community. We've all got these things. And I had to learn something. I couldn't let things that I have no control of to control me. So I took control of my life. I used to blame my dad for everything he keep growing up. He was the reason I skipped school. He was the reason I tried drugs. He was the reason for my attitude. He was the reason for this. I blamed him for everything. But if I wanted to be honest, that was my excuse. That was my way to cast the blame on somebody else. Because my dad didn't make me smoke. He didn't make me drink. He didn't make me skip school. At the end of the day, I had to take control of my life. And so I literally decided to take control of my life and stop blaming everybody else for everything else. See, some of us, we face adversity. We didn't have any part in it. It's just life, man. It's tough. Others of us are poor choices, and we have self-inflicting wounds and our backs against the wall because we've made some poor choices, and choices have consequences. And so for me, Whichever side of the aisle you're on, if it's because you've been making some poor choices and now your, your back's against the wall, or it's because life has been ch challenging and we don't have all the answers and we don't know why, whichever way we come from, I promise you this, at the end of the day, as long as we've got breath in these lungs, there is hope that we have the ability to achieve and to become and to experience all that life has for us and we're in this thing to win. I can, I must, I will, I refuse to believe that I'm a product of my environment. I want to be a doctor, a teacher, a scientist, an actor, an athlete at the end of the day. There won't be a person, there won't be an administrator, there won't be a parent, there won't be a friend who can sow doubt to me. At the end of the day, hard work works. I'm in control of my life. I'm writing my story. I'm going to get to the next level. I'm going to use my friends. We are better together. And I won't stop until I get my last breath. That's what all of us in here, I need you to understand. That you are writing your story. So I literally, guys, I wrote Change the World 10 years ago on my wall. Pop! And I decided I 
I'm going to slow down. And I'm going to write down my dreams and my goals. And I know my environment right now, I'm in prison. But you know what? My environment and my surroundings don't have to dictate my attitude. My environment and my surroundings don't have to control my growth and my personal development. I'm not a product of my environment. I'm a product of what I do. So literally, as I wrote Change the World, I decided simply this. I'm going to not be impulsive anymore. I wanted to write my dream and my vision down. I had to figure out my why. My why. I personally wanted to become an inspirational speaker. I wanted to give hope to the hopeless, be a voice to the voiceless. I wanted to travel the nation, travel the world, travel everywhere I could, and let people know that we are all beautifully broken. We are better together. We can achieve and accomplish anything. And at the end of the day, don't give up. And so I decided 10 years ago in my prison cell when I wrote Change the World Down and I slapped it on there. Listen, objects in the mirror are closer than things appear, y'all. Listen, all of, you, all of you that drive, you have a license or when you get to get your license in your side view mirror, you're going to see these words. Objects in the mirror are closer than things appear. On every one of our vehicles it says that. And what that means is what you see looking back in that reflection. It's closer than what it really is. And I promise you, your dreams, your goals, what you want to achieve, what you want to become, it doesn't start when you graduate high school, it won't be when you go to college, it's right here, right now. Make good choices, great things happen. Let me slow down and understand my dreams and my goals are objects in the mirror. They are closer than they appear. When I wrote Change the World and I slapped it on a little prison wall, even though I was in prison, I needed to begin at that moment to begin to create habits in my heart and in my mind to, to, to develop these characteristics that would help me overcome and override and surpass the adversity that I was going to face. And then I had to change my mindset, my perspective. At the end of the day, take control of my life. So, I, so that's exactly what I began to do. I began, even in prison, slow down. And later today, when we, when we have the second session later this afternoon, I'm gonna talk about these five things. It's called the five. It's the five, it's five principles in my heart and my mind that I have developed that's helped change my life. Because see guys, Transparency, accountability, working hard, good choices, and valuing people. Transparency, accountability, working hard, good choices, and valuing people. Transparency, accountability, hard, good hard work, good choices, and valuing people. Those five principles have changed my life. I didn't do 15 years in prison. Even though my environment wasn't the greatest and I was an intimate adversity, I took control of my life. I started working on my, my character and on my attitude and what I wanted to achieve and what I wanted to become and stop blaming others, and I apply those things. Hard work works, show. I got released 11 years early, why? Because hard work and good choices will always create opportunities for you to win. When you make good choices, good choices will always position you in life to win, I promise you. I got released 11 years ago, and 11 years ago, when I got, no, I got, I got released 11 years early, so in 2009, I was sentenced to 15 years. I walked out of there 11 years early in 2013. And I came to my hometown. And I met, you know what I was met with in my hometown? I was with the people in my hometown saying, Nathan, you want to be an inspirational speaker. And they knew who I used to be in the past. You want to be a motivational speaker. And they would say, Nathan, you're not qualified. You don't have the education. That's a pretty big field out there. Why don't you pick a safer dream? They would say, Nathan, you don't have the vernacular or the communication skills that can persuade an audience in a crowd. And I remember my dad smacking this ball off my face. And I said, you know what? I'm not the most gifted. I'm not the most talented. And I don't have the vernacular that can communicate a message that can persuade an audience in a crowd. But I can learn. And I refuse to let your fear of failure speak it over my life. I'm in control of my life. And I went for my dream. You know what, guys? This school year. You've got to punch fear in its face. And I'm not promoting any kind of violence, but what I'm saying is those fears of failures, those fears of doubts, those fears of self disbelief, at the end of the day, you've got to do it afraid. Listen, failure's only failure until you stop. What I've learned, I've learned when I make mistakes, I'm just learning what not to do. I make tons of mistakes. I turn left when I should turn right, but I'm moving. I refuse to stay idle. And as I'm turning left, and as I'm turning right, Right? I'm constantly getting, gaining traction towards my dream. So what I did, all those people tell me that I couldn't, I literally, when I was in prison, they let me go talk to Ball State University. And at Ball State University, 
they recorded it, and I was in street clothes, and I, I did a presentation, I, I, good choices were great to make opportunities for me, and when I got released, I contacted the prison, I said, hey, yo, prison, can you send me that CD you recorded? Like, my hair was down, I was yelling like a lion, it was terrible, right? And uh, I took this terrible CD that I had, and I burned, literally, this promotional CD, like, in 2009, the digital world, it was growing, it was expanding, but like, the iPhone 2 was out or something, right? So when I came home, I literally burned this CD, and I put this promotional CD of me like talking. I put Adele, there's a fire as background music, I don't know why. And I literally took this CD, and I mailed it to a hundred schools all across Indiana. I was like, listen, teachers and educators, they can't be that busy in life. Listen, I'm gonna take this CD, I have my chicken scratch handwriting on it. I literally had, I had spoken at 10 venues in prison. I was in prison for all of them, right? But I took out this, like, bio sheet. I had spoken at this place and this place. I didn't tell them I was in prison. There was too much information. But I told them I had spoken in places before, right? And I took this CD and I mailed it all across the state of Indiana. I spent $400 of money that I didn't have. Listen, y'all, you got to be willing to invest in me. I don't even talk about money. You'll be willing to invest your time, your resources. You gotta invest in you. No one's gonna give this to you. If you it takes sacrifice. When all your friends are out there ripping and running and having a good time, if you wanna to get to that next level of education and you have a test that's due and you have a study, man, you gotta invest in you. So I, I mailed out a hundred packets, right? And I just knew teachers were that busy. I mean, I didn't even realize, honestly, most computers don't even have CD ROMs anymore. Like, why? Like, cars don't have seats. Like, hear me this, right? So I know 100 packages of these CDs are. I'm like, yep, this is it. Breakthrough's happening. I waited a long time. But one school called me back. So you're telling me there's a chance. One school allowed me to come in. Listen to me, guys. How many of you in here have a dream and a goal with your Right? Listen to me. Having a dream and having a goal is not enough. You gotta respect that thing, y'all. You gotta respect your dream and your goal. And what I mean by that is you gotta handle your dream and your goal with care. It's fragile. And at the end of the day, when you respect it, that means are you giving it your time, your sacrifice, your energy? If you don't respect your dream and your goal, opportunities will happen. Listen, if you make good choices, Good choices are going to create opportunities for you to win. I promise you, make good choices, great things happen. But when that opportunity arises, and it will arise, if you haven't respected your dream and your goal, when the opportunity arises, you won't be prepared, and you won't be able to, to perform and to execute. When dreams and goals are in your heart, you got to respect it and, and, and give it your time, your effort, your sacrifice, because it will make room for you. You will get an opportunity, but you got to be ready for it, y'all. And I walked into that first school, I let it rip. I talked for 90 minutes. You could hear a pin drop. Kids and students were coming forward about self harming and suicide and prediction. It was a crazy moment. One school turned to 10. This was four years ago. One school turned to 10, 10 turned to 30, 30 turned to 70. Two years ago, I did 135 schools coast to coast, my feet on these floors, auditoriums and gyms. I became the number one book school speaker in the nation. Last year, I did 287 schools coast to coast. <laughs> Listen to me right now. This dude with the funny man bun. I don't even listen, y'all. This is a one of a kind, because I don't ever dress like this. I'm in, I'm in a hoodie and jeans, and I'm sitting right next to my people in high school, middle school, because I'm one of y'all. My story, your story, it's the story. It's a story of young men and young ladies that are sick and tired and we're not going to settle for less. And at the end of the day, we're not going to blame anybody else. We're going to take ownership. We're going to respect our dreams. We're going to believe we can, I must, I will, I refuse to fail. At the end of the day, nobody can stop me but me. When I look in that mirror and I see those words change the world, I understand the only person that's going to keep me from changing the world and pursuing my dreams and my goals. It won't be the principles and the teachers and the counselors and friends and mentors. It won't be people who, it won't be anybody. It won't be those negative friends in my lifestyle. It won't be parents. The only person stopping me from success is me. Because will I get out of my own way? Will I stop compromising myself? Listen to me, y'all. You never have to compromise yourself. And I'm passionate about these things that because it's more than just a talk to me. I genuinely mean when I look across this room, men and women here are born to leave the fingerprints and could leave behind a destiny. You're born to leave your fingerprints on history, y'all. In this room are doctors, 
and teachers and engineers and innovators and people who make a difference socially, emotionally, and culturally in this nation. In this room are junior achievers. In this room are young men and young women that have to begin to believe in themselves. You know, I can, I must, I will, I promise you, I'm no different than you. We're in this together. The person to your left, the person to your right. We've all got stuff in there. We're better together. You know what? And I appreciate, yes, we're, we've, we've, we've had some success. And currently we're the top of school speaker in the nation the last few years. But you know what? Still today, my wife and my kids, hold on, where are at? Them? Yeah, I know for real, my wife's hot. I always say that, I married up. I'm so, shoot, I don't deserve her. They're at the beach right now, probably having fun. Who cares about the weather? My daughter on your right, her name is Juliana, I call her Juju Bug. She's a headache. My son on my left, her name's Ashton. I adopted him when he was two, he's mine, you can't have him. But my wife and my kids, every single day, still to this day, in my home in Kokomo, Indiana, in my bathroom, I have these exact same words, change the world, that I have written down in my prison 10 years ago. And every day, I wake up and I look in the mirror. And I look in the mirror, and literally, I can, I must, I will. I look in the mirror, and I said, I'm gonna make choices and decisions today that's going to bring that object in the mirror closer to what it appears. Because my choices directly affect my future. I'm not gonna compromise, I'm not gonna give in. Listen, I know in, in, in high school there's a high, there's a high dropout rate at times. Listen to me, y'all. Don't you dare let that be any thought or even thing creep into your mind. We're not dropping out of this. I don't care how hard it takes. I don't care if it has to take an extra year. I don't care if you have to kind of be out of yourself and then you gotta take order. Don't you dare drop out, man. Don't you dare believe giving up is the answer or the solution. If it's not, I believe in you. The people next to you believe in you. If you know you have friends who are struggling, who are thinking about, you know what, maybe I should just drop out, I should just do this, and I should do this. Don't you dare do everything in your power to speak up and to encourage them. We are powerful together. When we are together, we are better, we are more impactful, we are influential. We're in this, y'all. Later, I know some of you may leave, but I hope a lot of you can stay. I have this, these two things that I'm going to do up here. These changed my life. It's about priorities. It's about broken crowns calling them too. I want y'all to say this with me like you mean it. I need you to shout it with like every roar, every bear roar, every lion roar, every gorilla roar, whatever. I don't care what it is. I want you to say I can. I can. I can. How many of you, on one thing that I talked about, and y'all just y'all just sat here for like an hour and forty-five minutes, right? And a lecture and a talk, and like, like this is you guys are just locked in, and I appreciate that. But how many of you can say on one topic that we talked about, we talked about like life in general, right? Everything. How many of you can say that I something that I said resonated and impacted you today? Raise your hand, right? Absolutely. Watch this. You walk through those doors. You're like, man, it motivated me. I feel impacted. I feel like full of energy. Motivation's good, but motivation's outside of you. It takes motion, movement. That world, we all know too well. We'll walk out there and life smacks us in the face. You can't just be motivated. You gotta find that inspiration that comes from you, that internal fire, that internal desire. You see, Moments of impact help shape and create our life. Things that have happened in our past help navigate where we end up in our destination. 
for all of you that raise your hand and say, you know what, Nathan, that impacted me. This, this first talk, this first session, it, it, man, it hit me. You've got to make this moment of impact in your life. A moment when you remember when Nate Harmon, the dude from Indiana with the funny man bun, ran around here for an hour and 45 minutes and you set you and you're walking out of this place with something tangible, a thought, a belief, a question, something. We're going to take two pictures because pictures, I wanted to be a photographer for National Geographic. Pictures carry weight. Many of you, especially if you ask your moms, there will be pictures that when you see a picture, it starks and sparks emotion, thought, time, place, people. Pictures are powerful. So we're going to take two pictures. Every one of you, especially that raised your hand. You've got to capture here in 2019 before school started at this at this junior achievement. I can for those that are part of the the the, 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 the conference and those that have showed up and said I wanted to come for the parents that are here. You gotta make this a moment of impact where this talk is different. This wasn't some of this election. This was life, it was alive. We're gonna take two pictures. First picture I want you to take, I want all of you to take a picture of me standing in front of you at this conference right now. Just take a picture of me. I don't care, I'm not smiling. I don't care if you give me an ugly face, a weird look, an angry face. Just take the picture. The second picture I want you to take will be the most important picture you've taken. I want you to take a picture of yourself. I don't care about your perfect selfie. I don't care about your perfect filter. I want you to take a picture of yourself, raw, real, and the people around you. Take the picture. Listen, for some of you I may not see this afternoon, but check this out. Actually, I don't always get to do this, but I'm gonna do this for this right now. Here. Hold on. Uh, yeah, here we go. Hold on, I'm gonna do it this way. Boom. And this way. And I won't forget the little point over here. Listen, I have an amazing team. I, I know I'm already getting more of this a little in the second session. I know social media, right? Man, there's a lot of negativity out there. I wish, and I'm actually going to doing this big documentary where we're going to be talking a lot about screen time, a lot of cool stuff about the mental health aspect of life. But it's not going anywhere. And so I refuse to just complain about social media or complain about the digital world and how it's affecting us. I'm gonna do all that I can in my power with my team. We put out powerful, positive content day in and day out. We put, we try to combat all the negativity in the world with inspirational pieces day in and day out. And all of you sitting in here, I have an amazing team and our Instagram, our IG account, Your Life Speaks, it's all my stuff, it's called Your Life Speaks. If you got an IG account, if you got a YouTube channel, there's so many other talks, there's so many other cool videos. If you've got any of those medias, we have a Snapchat, but we, it's not very effective, we don't use it very often. But our IG account, Your Life Speaks, and our, our Facebook and Twitter for all the old people. No. Yes. Put it in But our IG and our YouTube are the top vehicles that we use. And if you have those, man, we always are putting out powerful content, powerful inspiration. If you have that, join the journey. And then we also, um, every Sunday night, for any of you podcasters out there on Spotify and Apple, um, bus route, all platforms. If you type in Real Life with Nathan Harmon, we have an amazing podcast we put on every Sunday night. It's me and Dr. Doug, a psychologist from Durango. He hits you with the psychology. I'm an idiot. We work great together. It's beautiful, man. He yells at me a lot. That's cool, though. I'm just real. He tried to, he tried to decompress his brain for mine. But every, no, it's, it's good stuff, though. But every Friday, every Saturday, Sunday night, Real life drops a new podcast, and if you just type it in, you'll see that. Um, and then we always give away photo where to go. Why is this? This is not working right at all. I'm trying to get this. Boom. No current slide. Bam. Where are you at? We always give away tons of free merch um, throughout the year, and we'll give away. We have all kinds of merchandise, landings, all kinds of stuff, shirts, and designs that have at yourlifespeaks.org or nathanrobin.org. But we always give away free merch, and when we give away free merch, we always select it from the people that have texted in. So if you text in YLS to number 33222, you enter into a database, and when we give away free merch, you may just get a, a text message saying, hey, you want some free stuff, what do you want? And then we'll send you some cool stuff. So if you want that, just text that. Can we give, can we give 
the bow, like just everybody part of here at the JA, the bow, all the all this, all the volunteers, all the people that are here, all the administrators, everybody here. We just give them a big round of applause, please. Yeah. And um, thank you guys so much for this first talk today. I, I really hope some of you can stick around and, and we dig into this next part. I want to go really over the five of transparency, accountability, working hard, good choice for value people. It's been what's changed my life. It's how I've got from where I was when I was decided to change to go on that today. And so with that being said, where your life speaks, I'm Nathan Harmon. Thank you so much.